Amen. Joshua chapter 15, that's quite a read. <laughs> Good job, brother. Yeah, lots of uh, cities. So basically in Joshua chapter 15, about half the chapter is describing the borders of Judah. So we're talking about Judah. We're going to study out Judah a little bit um, this evening. But basically about half the chapter talks about the borders of Judah. I mean, it verbally describes the borders. And then the other half, the last half of the chapter, describes the cities that are within Judah. So I'm not going to necessarily go through verse by verse and describe every single border. Um, we'll go through and we'll look at the, the children of Judah, the tribe of Judah. Of course, one of the 12 tribes. Look at verse number 1 of uh, Joshua chapter 15, where the Bible reads, this, this then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families, even to the border of Edom, the wilderness of Zin southward was the uttermost part of the south coast. So basically, to describe the land of Judah, on the east side of the land of Judah was basically the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea. And then if you are familiar with the geography of the area, um, the north border was right around the Jericho, um, Jer the city of Jericho, and then south. And then the west border was actually the Mediterranean Sea, or the, the Great Sea, as it's called um, in this chapter. And if, if you read through the Bible, um, the, the, the south border, of course, was a city called Kadesh Barnea, which kind of marks the south border of um, the land of Judah. So that's kind of the, the north, east, south, and west. But, you know, this border changes if you, um, if you recognize some of the cities that are named here, like Akron, you know, those are the cities of the Philistines. Basically what happened to Judah over time was the Philistines kind of moved in on them from the west. And that's what, um, during the time of, of David, of course, the southern kingdom of Judah, we'll talk about that a little bit um, in tonight's sermon. But basically, the Philistines were just a constant thorn in the side of Saul and David especially, and they, they were pushing in constantly from the west um, of their border. So their border was supposed to be all the way to the sea, but the Philistines were just always there um, causing them trouble. Turn to Genesis 49. Let's look at the tribe of Judah and see um, there's a lot of unique things about the tribe of Judah that were prophesied in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, of course, is when Jacob is giving the blessings to all of his um, 12 sons, and Judah being one of those. Um, there's, a, there's a few verses in Genesis 49 that give us some very interesting prophecies about Judah and their, their role in not only end times prophecy, but you know, just um, their role of you know, their, their role in the history of the world. Let's put it that way. Let's step through it. Look at verse number eight of Genesis chapter 49. So Jacob, of course, is going through his sons and giving his blessings. And in verse number 8, he says, Judah, he starts out saying, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. So here in verse number 8, Jacob is giving this blessing and he's basically prophesying to Judah, saying that, look, you know, if, look who are thy father's children? Thy father's children are, you know, your brothers. And he's saying here that they're going to all bow down before you. And then he's basically saying, um, they, they'll, your brethren shall praise you, and thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. So this is a prophecy specifically just laying out the power of Judah and how powerful Judah is going to be. Now Judah, if you know through the Bible, Judah was actually the last of the tribes or the last of the kingdoms. Of course, we had the breakup of you know, the nation of Israel that went into the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes, and then he had Judah, a little bit of Benjamin, and the Levites that made up Judah, the south um, kingdom. The south kingdom lasted the longest. It was the strongest, it was the most powerful, and it's because it stuck closest to the word of the Lord. Look at verse number nine. So this is just, verse number eight is just saying, look, Judah, you are going to be more powerful. You know, your brothers, the other tribes, they will be, you know, subservient to you. You are going to be a powerful tribe, which came to pass. Look at verse number 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? Again, comparing Judah here as, uh, to a lion. We'll look at that in a few minutes. But again, talking about just the power 
of Judah. Look at verse number 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. This is a very specific prophecy that has, um, that has current historic um, prophecy to it, and then it also has end times prophecy to it. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of all the people be. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. So the Bible here is saying that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter meaning the, the crown, the, the uh, royalty, the, uh, the power of the king shall not depart from Judah. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. We see that this matches up with the prophecy of the Davidic kingdom given to King David. Now remember in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David was wanting to build the Lord's house. He was wanting to build the temple of the Lord. Nathan said, yes, go ahead and build the temple of the Lord. And then, of course, the Lord came to Nathan and he said, no, I don't want David to do it. Go tell David that his son will build the temple. And of course, that's why Solomon ended up building the temple. But in that same um, message, the Lord also gave this important message to David. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7 and look at verse number 16. The Bible says, In thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, and thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So there's two parts to this promise. Basically, um, the, the Bible here is saying God is telling David that your throne will always be with you. It will always be in your family, which, look, that was a difficult thing to, uh, that had to be a miracle that that happened. If you, all you have to do is read the history of the northern kingdom, and it's every king or two kings, there's a new dynasty that takes over. By dynasty, I mean a new ruling family. That there's a, a man who becomes king, his son takes over the kingdom after him, and then somebody else just comes in and murders everybody, and they take over with their family. That never happened in the kingdom of Judah. It was always father, son, father, son, father, son, prophesying and making this prophecy fulfilled. And look, there were some very sketchy moments in the kingdom of Judah, but God always kept, he always kept this prophecy to be true. All right, and ultimately, and you say, how is thy throne established forever? The kingdom, turn to Matthew chapter 1, the kingdom of Judah was eventually, you know, taken into captivity by the Babylonian Empire. So how could this possibly be true? We'll turn to Matthew chapter 1. So ultimately we see through the history of the kings of Judah that it was always David's family, David's sons, 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 grandsons, great-grandsons, etc., that keeps the crown, that keeps the throne in Judah. And then in Matthew chapter 1, we see that that established forever is brought to light. Look at Matthew chapter 1 and just verse number 1. And the Bible says this. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. And then look what it says. The son of David, the son of Abraham. So Jesus Christ was a descendant of David's family. And that is how that David's kingdom is established not for a long time, not for the history until Babylon takes over, but forever. So basically, we see that Judah is kept through David's family, and then Jesus Christ takes it into eternity. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Now tell me, now look at this. Tell me, as we started this in Genesis chapter 49, and we're going into Matthew chapter 1, we're going into 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see all these kings and their sons, and the kings and their sons, all these things just come to pass. Tell me that the Bible was not written by God. I mean, tell me, I mean, these fishermen must have been geniuses that came up with this, right? Look at Revelation chapter 5, but wait, there's more. Revelation chapter 5, look what the Bible says. And one of the elders said unto me, weep not, behold, what was Judah called in Genesis chapter 49? Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals 
thereof. Notice the name of Jesus Christ here. The names of Jesus Christ. The Lion of Judah matches up with Genesis chapter 49. The Root of David. You're like, whoa, Root of David? Turn to J John chapter 8 and verse 58. Root of David, I mean, they must have meant branches of David. Right? They must have meant branches because Jesus came after David. Jesus was, you know, there was all these descendants, and then 400 and some years later, there was Jesus. Right? But no. Look at John chapter 8 and verse, let me go there myself. John chapter 8 and verse number 58. John chapter 8 and verse number 58. Look what the Bible says. Now this is super interesting. It doesn't say the branches of David because when a tree grows, what grows first? The root. It starts from the root. Everybody knows this. So the Bible is calling Jesus the root of David, not the branch of David, not a descendant of David. Yes, Jesus the man. This is just such a perfect prophecy because Jesus the man was a physical descendant of David the man. But, look at verse 58 of John chapter 8. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Jesus, even though Matthew chapter 1 says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Jesus was the first. Amen. Even before he was physically born as the man. Yep. Kind of like the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. The first and the last. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then I'm going to read for you Genesis 49. Genesis 49. And actually, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read Genesis 49 and verse number 10 one more time while you're turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So look, in, in, let me read for you one more time verse number 10 of Genesis 49, 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. We just looked at that. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. That's until Jesus comes. And unto him, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Well, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 1. What is Jesus going to do? What is Jesus going to do? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now we beseech you. Brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him. This is, this is prophesying Jesus gathering us all up when he comes again. In Genesis chapter 49. Go back to Genesis chapter 49 and look at verse number 11. Genesis chapter 49 and look at verse number 11. These men, if, if these men wrote the Bible, they must have known a bunch of things that they could have not have possibly known and matched all these things up perfectly and made no mistakes. It's impossible. Amen. It's just, uh, as you see how the, the Old Testament and the New Testament just complement each other and these prophecies that just could not have been... Look, if this prophecy, people could say, well, you know, they, they, they knew the Old Testament, so um, they just... You know, they did that so it matched the Old Testament. Really, you can, you can take kings over hundreds of years and make sure that they all descend directly from each other and you can make that happen? Look, men can't keep empires going for more than 150 years or 180 years on average. It takes God intervening to do these things. It's proof that the Bible was written by God. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 11. Binding, still talking about Judah here, talking about the prophecy of the tribe of Judah. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. This is talking about just the riches that Judah is going to have. They're going to be a very, um, they're going to be a very um, rich nation. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and look at verse 19. We are also going to have those same riches. We are also going to benefit from that through the tribe of Judah in a certain way. And look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. The Bible says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So we get those same riches of Judah through spiritual riches through the Lion of Judah, which is Jesus Christ. 
Go back to Joshua chapter 15. So you see, Judah is a very special tribe in the nation of Israel. Go back to Joshua chapter 15. Now I'm not going to go through um, every single verse um, describing the borders. Um, I've already described to you the borders. I want to start and I want to point out a story in verse number 13 of Joshua chapter 15. Go down to Joshua chapter 15 and verse number 13. And we see um, one of my favorite characters in the Bible once again, Caleb. And we see another story about Caleb here. More wisdom from Caleb, and it'll be one of our main um, points of the sermon this evening. But look what the Bible says. And unto Caleb, the son of Jethunah, he gave, part, gave a part among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua. So Caleb got some of this land because, remember, he was promised the land that he walked on as a spy, and he walked through the southern kingdom. And Caleb drove, and even to the city of Arba, the father of Anak, the giants, remember, which is Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shisha, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. So that's what uh, we, we studied last week when Caleb conquered his land. And went up into the inhabitants, into the, into, thence to the inhabitants of Deber, and the name of Deber before was Kirjath Sefer. And look at verse number 16. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass, as she came unto him, that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wouldest thou? He says, What do you want? Who answered, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. So Caleb, we get some wisdom from Caleb here. And, you know, he gives us, you know, he gives us some tips. Dads, he gives us some tips on how to choose a husband for your daughter. And he basically, go to Numbers chapter 30. So for the first thing, I'll get to those tips in a second, but let me just make this point. Go to Numbers chapter 30. A father should be involved in who his daughter marries. That's one thing that we see demonstrated from Caleb here. And he does it in a, in a fairly brilliant way, actually. Go to Numbers chapter 30. But the point, first point I want to make is, a father should be involved in who his daughter marries. Look at Numbers chapter 30. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, that all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand, and the Lord shall forgive her, because her father disallowed her. So this here is saying that, and it talks about the wife um, as well, but basically this is saying that the father has a say in the vows that his daughter vows. If she wants to make a promise or a vow, the father gets to say, it's good or it's not good. He, gets, he, he has veto power is what the Bible is saying here. Well, guess what marriage is? Marriage is a promise. Marriage is a vow. Meaning, the father has direct say on who his daughter marries. And look, that tradition even stands in traditionless America today. But that, this is where it comes from. It's a biblical concept that a father has say in who his daughter vows her marriage to. It's, look, it's protection for the daughter. So daughters, listen to your fathers. And the second thing, from the wisdom of Caleb here, is that he wanted a warrior for his daughter. He wanted somebody who was brave to marry his daughter. He did not want some weakling marrying his daughter. So he put forth a test, is what he did. He put forth a test for this man to step up and say, hey, who can ever conquer this land can marry my daughter. He laid forth a test. I mean, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. It's a good idea to find out what type of man is going to marry his daughter. Look, it's not just what type of man he says he is. We see a lot of that today. 
You know, men say that they're a certain way. They say they're, you know, a certain, uh, you know, they promise things and they say, oh, you know, I'm the greatest and all this. I see this all the time with people applying for jobs and, you know, they say that they're the best person ever and they've got all this experience, but then you actually see them, meet them, and it's just nothing of what they said. So young men need to keep this in mind. Young men need to keep this in mind. When they come to get married, when, young men, when you go to get married, first of all, you need to realize that there's going to be a, a father that's going to be looking to see what you're all about, who you really are. And there, sh there should be a testimony that a young man brings with him. A testimony. A life that is on a path somewhere should be obvious to the father. Look, there should be a demonstration of, of their character that they say that they have. Not just words on what they want to do in the future. You know, I have no place to live, I have no car, I have no job, I have no plan, but things are going to be different when I marry your daughter. I don't think so. I don't think so. I need to see, look, this father, this father needs to see, I want to see two years in the past. That's what I want to see. I want to see two years in the past because that will show me what the future will look like. That's what I want to see. I want to, I want to see more. I want to hear more than a plan. I want to see what those past two years have looked like. I want to know what you've been up to. That's what this father wants to see. You know, if I look back on that past, I think that it'll show me the future for my daughter. I want to see stability. I want to see character. Show me goals that you've achieved. This is what I want to see. That's what Caleb was doing here. He just said, you know what, go do this. Here's your goal. Go do it. And then you can marry my daughter. So look, I mean, young men that want to get married, it takes more than just words. It takes more than just words. It takes it takes action, it takes a demonstrated path that you're on in your life. And you know how you demonstrate the path that you're on in your life to a Caleb that you're going to meet one day? You show him the road that you've traveled. That's how you do it, young men. That's why I push so hard in the directions that I push, especially with the young men in this church. But back to the overall point, the father is protection for his daughter. And that's what Caleb was doing. The father has a say over the vows of his daughter. And daughters, you'd be wise to, be, to listen to your father in this area. Go back to Joshua chapter 15. Joshua chapter 15. So in Joshua chapter 15, starting in verse number 20, we just go through this huge list of cities. And the city that just jumped out to me that, that I want to tell an interesting story about is in verse... Look at the city of Keilah, the city of Keilah, and go to 1 Samuel chapter 23, 1 Samuel chapter 23. One of the cities listed is the city of Keilah, and we'll look at that in 1 Samuel chapter 23. In verse 44 of Joshua 15, we see, and Keilah, which is one of the cities that is going to be in Judah. But go to 1 Samuel chapter 23, we'll see an interesting story about the city of of Keilah. 1 Samuel chapter 23, look at verse number 1. 1 Samuel 23 and verse number 1. Again, we see the Philistines. As I told you earlier, the Philistines are pushing in onto um, the borders of Judah. And look what it says in verse number 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 23. The Bible says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. They're going in and they're just they're fighting against this city, they're overtaking this city, and they're just they're they're spoiling the city, meaning they're going in and they're taking all their grain, they're taking all their food, they're taking all their supplies. Look at verse number two. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. Look at verse number five, for sake of time. Look at verse number five. So David, so David inquires. He sees that Keilah's under attack from the Philistines. He asks God, this is smart. That's a smart thing. Should I fight this fight? Should I fight this fight? God says, go fight this fight. So David goes down there. Look at verse number five. So David and his men 
went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines. This is David and his mighty men. This is David and his 600 men. Okay, this isn't David and thousands of men. This is David and his 600 men that are, you know, they're running from Saul at this point. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. He literally saves them. He rescues them from the Philistines. And then in the next couple of verses, Saul, Saul, King Saul, finds out that he's there and he's on this rampage trying to kill David. He finds out that he's in the city of Keilah and he comes after David in Keilah. Keep in mind, David has just saved the city. He has just saved the people from the Philistines. Look at verse number 10. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. So the Lord, he asks, is Saul coming to get me? And God says, yes, he's coming. Verse number 12. Then, then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me, deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? So this, first of all, shows some wisdom on the side of David right here. Because David's like, are these men going to give me up to um, Saul? I mean, you know, uh, maybe a less experienced person would say, these, I'm, these, I just saved these people. You know, we're good. I mean, we're all going to be together, and there's not going to be anything like this. But David says, look, are these people going to deliver me up? Are they going to turn on me and give me up to Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. And you're like, what? He just saved them. And here God says, yeah, they're going to turn you over to Saul. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbore, he forbore to go forth. So Saul gave up on the pursuit. He knew David had left. But look, here's the thing. People will stab you in the back. <laughs> I mean, David was smart enough to know that. He was smart enough to know. And you know what? Here's what I think David knew. Here's why I think David knew that. These men, these men of Keilah, think about this. These men of Keilah needed help. There was clearly more men than 600 in Keilah. Or I think there was. Okay, so these men needed these specific 600 men, these few men, to come and bail them out of this situation. So here's what David kind of knew. He's like, the first sign of trouble and the reason that he knew he probably needed to ask God if these men were going to give him up and turn him over is because they needed help in the first place. Does that make sense? Because they were already more men than David and his men, and they needed help in the first place. That was actually the first sign of trouble to David. The first sign of the character of these men in Keilah was that they just they couldn't do it themselves. So David had to come and do it. It's probably why they got in trouble in the first place. But look, it's kind of sad that men will turn you over for the same reason they needed you to help them. And the ones you help the most, like Keilah, you know, they're the ones that turned him over. So what to do? What to do about this, this conundrum? You know, here's the thing. Here, here's kind of the answer to this. You say, oh man, should I never help anybody? But here's the thing. We're to help people. Okay? We are to be loving to our brothers and sisters. We are to help people. But the trick of recognizing Keilah is this. People that you help that change not. Think of it that way. They just need help again and again and again and again. That's a sign of Aquila. Is that people that just, they just never, and you know, we're, look, we are all just looking for that person. Look, I know the hearts of the people in this room. And we are all just looking for that person that just needs that boost. That just needs that we're all just looking for that guy that just needs that push. And then he starts walking on his own. Or he starts running on his own. But here's the thing about that guy. He's rare. He's rare. Most people that need help 
are in the situation that they're in and they need help for a reason. And they're going to need help again, and they're going to need help again, and they're going to need help again. So what do we do? So what do we do? Well, here's what we do. Here's what I do. We suffer ourselves to be defrauded, number one. We suffer ourselves to be defrauded. But there is a line, and I've talked about this line before, there's a line that we don't help people sin. Amen. We, don't, we don't enable people to sin. And I think this is the mistake that we make as open-hearted brothers and sisters in Christ. I make it too. It's a mistake that we make. We don't realize that we're enabling sin. And the thing is, if you have men that you're helping, or women that you're helping, and there's absolutely no growth, and it's always the same help again and again and again, there is some sin there somewhere. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that many times that help is not help. So yes, suffer ourselves to be defrauded. You know, suffer ourselves to be defrauded, but we have to recognize when we are enabling sin. And that can be a fine line. And it takes some maturity to recognize that. And I'm talking about myself as much as I'm talking about anybody in this room. So anyway, there's some interesting um, lessons from the men of Keilah. But David knew that. It's interesting that David knew to ask that question. Are these men going to turn me over? <laughs> you know, I mean, he just saved them. I'm sure, there was, I'm sure there was a lot of celebrations. Don't you think that those men of Keilah were praising David? Don't you think that those people of that city, don't you think that there were some parades going on there? That there were some, I mean, there was only 600 of these guys in this entire city. They were just, I'm sure that they were just giving them everything that they wanted. They were praising them. But David had the wisdom to say, you know what? Why did you need my help? Well, these, are these guys going to turn me over? It's some wisdom from David there. So lesson, beware of people that don't begin walking on their own. Look, folks, here's the thing. And, and somebody told me this a couple days ago. Somebody, you know, just, just, I've heard some wisdom in the last couple days. But here's the thing. You should be growing here. We haven't been here for two months. You should be growing. You should not be the same as you were last year. You should not be just having the same problems year after year, month after month. There should be growth. Otherwise, I mean, seriously, what's the point if there's not growth? It's not like you're, you're coming here again and again to stay saved. That's not why you're coming here. You're coming here to grow. You're coming here to do the work of the ministry. You're coming here to do the first works of God. But there should be growth there. There should be, I mean, otherwise, what's the point? Go to the last verse of Joshua chapter 15. So we just see a huge list of cities. A huge list of seeds. Go to the last verse of Joshua chapter 15. And look at verse 63. Verse 63 says, As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. So this is the only city that it lists like this. The children of Judah had all these cities, but Jerusalem, it says, they had these Jebusites that just stayed there. And the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Of course, it's an incomplete conquest. We've talked about this. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 5 and look at verse number 6. 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse number 6. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse number 6. Look who else has to deal with the Jebusites. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem. This is David. Unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And even then, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24. Even then, so David takes Jerusalem from the Jebusites. But there's even, even more evidence that he still did not get rid of all the Jebusites. <laughs> Look at verse number 24 of 2 Samuel or I'm sorry, um, chapter 24 of 2 Samuel and verse number 18. So Solomon is going to go build the temple and look who he buys the land from. And Gad, in verse number 18, and Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar to the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. 
they actually bought the land for the temple from a Jebusite still um, in that area. So look, we see that it's an incomplete conquest. I've preached on that before. Now basically, Joshua chapter 15 is talking about the land of Judah, a very unique tribe of the 12 tribes. It's the blessed, you know, it has the blessings of the longest kingdom, the strongest kingdom. It's from the tribe. It, it's the tribe that David came from. It's the tribe that the descendants, you know, Jesus was born out of the descendants of those kings. And it had the blessings of, you know, not only being the tribe of the Messiah, but we're also blessed from the tribe of Judah. We see lessons of fathers for their daughters. I mean, we see, I mean, valuable lessons here. Turn to Proverbs chapter 17, just to wrap this up. We see valuable lessons that Caleb brings to us from, you know, the, how he chose the husband for his daughter. Look, Dad, Dad, you could literally save the day here. You could literally save the day. You could stop a bad situation that could cost your daughter her whole life. Think of that responsibility. You know, I mean, this could be, I mean, marrying the wrong person is an ugly story. You don't want it to be you. You don't want it to be your daughter. It's one that plays out for years and years. And look, it can affect, it can affect generations. Look at Proverbs chapter 17. Here's another one. Think of the guy that is marrying your daughter. Think of the guy, look, I'm not trying to scare you, but maybe I am a little bit. Think of the guy that is marrying your daughter. He's also going to be the man that is raising your grandchildren. Look at Proverbs 17 and verse number 6. The Bible says children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. It's interesting how it says, it says two things here. It says how valuable grandchildren are to their grandfathers, number one. And then it says how the glory of children are who? Are their fathers. This is how important the father is of a child is. It, look, the father of a child should literally be a glory unto that child. So you want that, I mean, you want, I mean, that's, that means you should be good. You should be a good thing under your child, I mean, unto your child. Just as Philippians 4 told us that our riches are the glory of Christ, likewise, the children are also enriched through the glory of their father in their family. It's super important who the father of your grandchildren are. Men. These, these grandchildren, think, of, I mean, think, think about it this way. These grandchildren are your crown. These grandchildren that maybe don't even exist today for you guys that have really young kids, they are, the, they are going to be your crown. And who their father is is super important important. It's the glory of them. So these are just some lessons, some random lessons from uh, Joshua chapter 15, and especially, you know, from the tribe of Judah and from Caleb. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.